breaking news, everybody. This is a DEFCON 1 4 alarm fire Catholic alert. Pope Francis is a heretic, according to the morons on Catholic Twitter. You see, in Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis had the gall, the audacity, to write, to exhort us. Quote, because of forms of conditioning and mitigating factors, it is possible that in an objective situation of sin, which may not be subjectively culpable or fully such, a person can be living in God's grace, can love, and can also grow in the life of grace and charity while receiving the church's help to this end. But wait, there's more. Discernment must help to find possible ways of responding to God and growing in the midst of limits. In certain cases, this can include the help of the sacraments. End quote. I just can't believe it. I wish I had my pearls on because I would clutch them now. And yet, this simple statement, accompanied by the ending footnote, has essentially given people, given malefactors, ammunition to undermine the entire pontificate of Pope Francis from day one. And the controversy continues even now. Pope Francis is saying that some people who are in irregular unions, you know, divorced and remarried, who, for whatever reason, because of their situation in life, because of their particular circumstances, have lessened or mitigated culpability for sins because of force of habit or some psychological factor that's taking place or any of the particulars of their situation, their intellect or their will is in some way compromised and they cannot freely choose to commit a grave sin that they might be still subjectively in a state of grace he said that and then those people if they seek to have recourse to the sacrament of reconciliation the sacrament of confession and they confess their sins then if they are not in mortal sin, they can approach the Holy Eucharist. He has been derailed because of this, because of that simple teaching. Kyle, is that fair? It is not fair, and it hasn't been fair since 2016. As you mentioned, this is a story, this is almost a fairy tale that won't die. And the fairy tale is the pseudo trad talking point uh, about that particular section of Amoris Laetitia and the footnote heard around, heard around the world. And that would be footnote 351. And you read it's the only footnote I know by like name and number. I can't name any other footnote in the world except 351. That's it. Yeah. And again, it won't go away. People keep bringing this thing back up. People complain about the dubia that was submitted back in 2016, like right after Amoris came out or shortly after it, whatever it was, within the same year. And everyone says, you know, Pope Francis hasn't responded to it. Pope Francis hasn't responded to it. Um, First of all, he doesn't need to, because if you read those dubia and then you read Amoris, go back and reread it, maybe. Most people haven't even read it. You will find that most, if not all, of those dubia questions were sufficiently already answered within the text itself, Amoris itself. And then there are some other things that you can point to, too, that back that up, that Francis didn't have to answer it. Um, but one of the things I, I think is, 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 interesting, is interesting about, I guess you could say, this inter iteration of the Francis pontificate, and I'm talking about new appointments to dicasteries. Uh, I think that Archbishop Fernandez, 
who is now Cardinal, Cardinal Manuel Fernandez, who is now the head of the DDF, the Castry for the Doctrine of the Faith. I think he's going in the direction of more transparency and more communication in terms of the mind of the Holy Father. Yeah, the newfound emphasis on transparency actually could have avoided so many problems in this pontificate from the beginning. Because, again, um, a lot of people attacked Pope Francis at the beginning just because they were scared. They were worried. Like with his emphasis on reaching out to the margins and on reaching out uh, with with the mercy of the gospel to people and almost extending the mercy as far as it can go without being heterodox, without being unorthodox, you know, that made people nervous. And I understood because I was one of them. You know, I felt a little bit jittery, like, oh, where is this going? If Pope Francis had only communicated like, look, guys, I'm totally going to be orthodox, like he does actually to a certain extent in Amoris Laetitia, and I'll, we'll read that in a second. But if he was just more vocal about this in speaking to the press, being like, look, I know there's consternation among the faithful. I know people are just looking for, despite reaching out with mercy to the margins, a reaffirmation that, yes, we're going to be faithful to the constant doctrine, to the unchangeable doctrine. People wouldn't have been so nervous. I think he could have circumvented a lot of the backlash that he actually got. Now, there's some people who are just bad actors who, you know, kind of um, were going to be gunning for this pope because of certain emphases that he had, because of certain tasks that he kind of foresaw for himself. Um, so there were just ideological enemies. But a lot of the pushback, a lot of the the pushback from like 90 percent of people who are giving it, you know, just the kind of rank and file Catholic um, who is attuned enough to church politics and church issues that they might look online. They might read articles every once in a while. The the nervousness and pushback that he's getting from those types could have been circumvented with just a few like words of comfort. Um, and yeah, it's true. Some of those words of comfort are in documents like Amoris Laetitia. But, you know, most people aren't going to sit and read a 20,000 word encyclical. They just aren't going to. And you have to know that. So optically, uh, things, you know, weren't maybe great at the beginning. And I think that's a fair critique of Pope Francis. And maybe he had good reasons that I'm just not, you know, savvy to for being more tight-lipped about where he was going with certain things. But certainly, I am appreciating, um, under this new DDF regime, some of the transparency that we're seeing and some of the willingness to engage with people who are just like, look, I just want a brief clarification. Like, forgive me if this is a dumb question, but, like, you don't think that revelation can change, right? Like, you believe that revelation is immutable. It's like, can you just throw me a bone? I know, Holy Father, maybe I shouldn't even be asking. Maybe I shouldn't be doubting this because, you know, you are the vicar of Christ on earth and you have special charisms and the Holy Spirit guides you in your ministry. But like, you know, forgive me. But can you just give me this? Because we are going beyond where John Paul II and Benedict the Sixteenth and previous popes allowed us to go disciplinarily. You know, we are transgressing certain fixed limits and we are going to the very edges of where we can be um, in extending mercy to people and still being within the sacramental and moral theology of the church. But the actual analysis, I mean, going back to the point of this video, people are up in arms and calling the pope a heretic for a Morris Letizia. And it's not even questioned. I mean, people who are tuning in to their favorite uh, grifting charlatan con men. Um, you know, it just, it's not even a doubt in their mind. You just throw it out in the comments. People say it in the comments like it's not even a problem. Like it's just, you know, they're reporting it like yesterday's news or, you know, just some fact or like, hey, I had Captain Crunch for cereal um, this morning. Something like that. They're, yeah, the Pope's a heretic. You know, what are we going to do with this heretical Pope? What are we going to do with him? And that's how they say it. Like it's an established fact. What did Pope Francis do in Amoris Laetitia that was heretical? What did he say? Because all he does is make the moral argument straight out of the catechism that all these people 
who are like attuned enough to church politics and to um, the magisterium of the church where they all know like basic moral theology and basic moral analysis. And they've probably given it for other people. Yeah, drug people are uh, hooked on drugs, you know. They might not actually be in mortal sin. You can just see them sitting around the dinner table, like telling their buddy or whatever, who's like a Protestant or something. And it's like, well, did you know that, you know, we don't even necessarily say that people who are addicted to heroin and uh, their wills are compromised and they're taking hard drugs and sure they're depriving themselves of the use of reason. But did you know that actually subjectively, although they're in objective grave sin, they might be in sanctifying grace. And they'll say it like a factoid. But when you say the same thing that Pope Francis said in the context of being divorced, remarried, not living as brother and sister uh, inerrantly, you know, um, then people accuse him of heresy. They say he's a heretic for using that exact same moral framework. Except, gee, I mean, the particulars of family life and the responsibilities that parents have and trying to work one's way out of certain situations that they had to deal with from like a broken prior marriage where they might have been an abandoned spouse and they were seeking um, a stable home life for their kids after a husband and wife walked out on them and left them like maybe destitute or something like that. The same people that will be like very tolerant and forgiving towards you know, some 22 year old heroin using scuzz bag or something that did this to himself voluntarily, then they'll be like, oh, hell no. You know, uh, th this person in this irregular situation, uh, you know, they can't be they can't be ministered to. They can't be. It's, it's almost um, it's almost like they just have no place in the church. And anytime you try and extend that analysis to them and certain mercies that would go along with that analysis to them, it's like anathema. I don't know if it's because it's sexual sin and we tend to draw the strongest lines on that or at least speak about that the most um, because, of course, that is a deadly sin. Of course, that does drag a lot of people to hell. Sins of the flesh are the perilous road that most people choose to hell. Um, but I don't know if it's because of that. But for whatever reason, Pope Francis just simply extending a traditional moral analysis that, you know, to be in subjective mortal sin, you have to have these three objective criteria all, you know, in unison of grave matter and full knowledge of the intellect and full consent of the will. He's just applying that to somebody in an, you know, adulterous second marriage. And we're calling him a heretic. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. And this really has colored his entire pontificate. People have been calling him a heretic since then, since he simply applied the church, traditional church moral theology to people um, in adulterous second unions, which it's grossly unfair. I mean, look with the beauty of hindsight and looking back on this situation, remember absolute glut of articles going up on things like crisis on 1 Peter 5 the prophets of doom shouting like oh he's in league with Cardinal Casper he's he's the liberal he's trying to tear down the church's traditional uh, moral teachings that was the mantra guys built their entire legacy on telling people how dangerous Pope Francis was how heterodox how he was how he wanted to destroy the church, how he could destroy the church. People built their entire legacies on that, swelled their subscriber base, you know, swelled their coffers with donations based on that narrative. And because they were so successful in raising the alarm and saying that the sky is falling, and that, that message absolutely permeated um, Catholic media and social media absolutely permeated it it became the mainstream narrative among people <clears throat> pardon me among people who are plugged in it became like it's hard not to bump into that and it's derailed a lot of the francis pontificate and it's really grossly unfair so i mean 
And thoughts on that, Kyle? Before I get into yeah, what this I mean, says? well, I just want to remind people of the the rad trad, the pseudo trad talking point on it. The claim here, you know, because we've been saying they've been claiming that Francis is a heretic. Specifically, what the accusation is is they're saying that he's just given this blanket allowance for people in in mortal sin to go and receive communion. Like if you were just Joe Schmo outside observer to all this this nonsense and you listened to the pseudo trads and you heard their talking points, basically that would be their thing is that now the Pope says it's okay if you're in mortal sin, uh, you can just go to go to communion. You don't have to repent, you don't have to go to confession, you just walk right up and, and receive communion. If that was if I was to distill it, that is was the actual narrative. And it's and it still is for, for many people. That's what they think a Morris Laetitia did. That's what they think the footnote did. That's what they think the accompanying clarifying letter to the bishops of Buenos Aires that Francis wrote them that has been put in the the AAS, the Acta Apostolica Sedes. Uh, you know, the juridical journal of the Holy See, thus making it magisterial. And we're, we, you know, if we have time, we'll, we'll definitely go through that document as well. And they claim all of that, all of that. The only thing it does, and the egregious thing that they claim it does, is that it allows people in mortal sin to receive communion unrepentant. That That is their claim. Like that, that is, I mean, that's egregious. You're saying that about a sitting pontiff. You're saying that you probably haven't even read the document because, I mean, yeah, go through it again. I mean, yeah, we can look at it again. Literally, as you said, what is Pope Francis doing here? He's giving people an application in moral theology uh, of moral theology 101 principles. Um, and and maybe, maybe most Catholics don't know this. I don't know. It's hard to gauge what people know and what people don't know. But guys like you and I, who have had moral theology classes, multiple ones, the first th one of the first things you learn in morality are those three criteria that make up the moral act. And as you mentioned, object, intention, and circumstances. And that's literally what the Pope is referencing right here. Um, there might be some mitigating circumstances. He literally says this in Amoris forms of conditioning and mitigating factors those are the circumstances that might reduce someone's culpability the classic example would be this you know take any sin whatever it is an objectively mortal sin pick one there's a lot of them if someone were to commit an objectively mortal sin we can't automatically impugn guilt to them or say that they were fully responsible and therefore fully culpable, meaning they were to be blamed for that. Because let's say the most obvious one, let's take the intention, the intentionality, let's say, or, or just their understanding of it. Let's say they didn't know it was a mortal sin. You can say two things could be true at the same time, that they have committed that mortal sin. Yes, it's objectively a mortal sin, but they didn't know it was a mortal sin. Therefore, that reduces their culpability. Sure, grave matter, grave matter, because it doesn't become mortal yes. until all three of those things are fulfilled. Yeah, and grave matter, of course, is the chief among. That's usually like the chief criteria. Most mm -hmm. of the time, if you commit grave matter, you're in mortal sin. Right. It's just like these special circumstances where there's mitigating, uh, mitigating circumstances. Yeah. yeah. And so if that if if you didn't know it was grave matter, um. You know, we can talk about the different types of knowing, invincible and invincible ignorance, but let's say you, you had no recourse to that knowledge whatsoever, which often happens for people who commit acts uh, of grave matter. Um, they didn't know. Therefore, that lessens it. That lessens it to, to, to still a sin, but a venial sin. And the question then is, well, can you take Holy Communion um, in, in a state of venial sin? Actually, yeah. Yeah, because it, it actually forgives your venial sin. That's what the Eucharist does even when you're in a state of venial sin. Um, so, I mean, that's just, just, again, it's morality 101, and that's 
literally all the Pope is saying here. Uh, now, now there's different, you know, ways to explain it in terms of uh, marriages and second marriages and divorces and all that. So it gets into the weeds of applying those moral criteria in those situations. But it's very easy to do. Well, let's just hear what the Pope says, because he says this all in Amoris Laetitia, which is really why the dubia weren't very necessary. You know, I understand. We want reassurance. We want reassurance that nothing doctrinally is changing. But the Pope is simply changing a discipline that John Paul II had left in place because he probably intuited that there would be certain abuses that would go along with this and perhaps, um, you know, people walking down this path of discernment, you know, they w would come to the wrong decision. And out of a desire to safeguard the Holy Eucharist and safeguard people's souls, safeguard it so that people aren't eating and drinking judgment on themselves in the state of mortal sin, you know, he held back on this option, on this disciplinary option. But Pope Francis, you know, consulting with the Holy Spirit through prayer and really attuned to the needs of our time, of a, a culture that's rife with broken marriages, that's swollen with broken marriages, um, he discerned differently. And as Donum Veritatis says, you know, the Pope, even when he's making a disciplinary change, is still guided by the Holy Spirit. So we have to acknowledge that here it's it's not just, you know— Jorge Bergoglio acting. It's Pope Francis guided by the Holy Spirit. And, and this is what he says. It's because he want, he does reassure people in Amoris. He does. He takes pains to. Let, let's listen. He says, quote, For an adequate understanding of the possibility and need of special discernment in certain, certain irregular situations, one thing must always be taken into account, lest anyone think that the demands of the gospel are in any way being compromised. The church possesses a solid body of reflection concerning mitigating factors and situations. Hence, it, it, it can no longer simply be said that all those in any irregular situation are living in a state of mortal sin and are deprived of sanctifying grace. Okay, fair enough. This is what we were just saying. And he goes on to quote the catechism, the catechism of the Catholic Church. He says the catechism of the Catholic Church clearly mentions um, these factors, uh, which would, quote, limit the ability to make a decision. Um, and he, he, he goes and quotes the catechism here, quote, imputability and responsibility for an action can be diminished or even nullified by ignorance, inadvertence, duress, fear, habit, inordinate attachments, and other psychological or social factors. Um, in another paragraph, the catechism refers once again to circumstances which mitigate moral responsibility and mentions at length, quote, affective immaturity, force of acquired habit, conditions of anxiety or other psychological or social factors that lessen or even extenuate moral culpability. So Pope Francis um, is saying that you know, let's not let the exception swallow the rule here. And he makes a special case for that, um, that, you know, this is not a catch all exception that's going to end up swallowing the rule. And we're going to be permitting everybody, even in bad conscience, to be accessing uh, the Holy Eucharist. No, he, he goes on and says um, that it's true that general rules set forth a good which can never be disregarded or neglected. But in their formulation, sometimes they cannot provide absolutely uh, for all particular situations. At the same time, it must be said that precisely for that reason, what is part of a practical discernment in particular circumstances cannot be elevated to the level of a rule. So ultimately, Pope Francis isn't saying there's a rule. You know, people in this, uh, you know, who are divorced and remarried can just go get access to the sacraments uh, to who are unrepentant or, you know, slip, fall back into sin while living in an irregular union, uh, being divorced and remarried, um, you know, they can, it, he's not just giving a catch all that they're good. They're good to just approach, um, the altar. He's not saying that he's saying 
particularly when they are living in sanctifying grace, although in an objectively disordered situation, those people can uh, approach after reconciliation, mind you, after reconciliation, and that's footnote 351, they can have recourse to the sacraments. And then in that same footnote, Kyle, as you pointed out earlier, you know, he talks first about reconciliation and then about the Eucharist. So after going to confession, then people who are living um, in a household with another, you know, with with their putative spouse or, um, you know, like civil spouse, uh, but they're in this re- irregular union, then given their circumstances, if their circumstances are such that they do not have subjective culpability for mortal sin, then they can approach. Then they can approach the altar. Then they can receive the body and blood of our Lord. So he's not saying people who aren't in sanctifying grace can live, um, can, can receive the body and blood of our Lord. He's not saying that. That would be uh, heteropraxy. There's no way to square that circle to say people uh, who are in mortal sin can receive the Holy Sacrament. You can't do that. He's not saying that. He never did say that. It's completely unfair for whatever your favorite podcaster is who likes to lie to you so he can you know, cynically enrich himself. It's not fair for them to say that. They're slandering the Pope. They're committing calumny against the Pope if they say that. You know, And that was the charge is he's just going to let everybody to Holy Communion. He's letting whoever he wants. He's disregarding the rules. They can now approach Holy Communion. And that's a lie. We were lied to. You guys were lied to. And we know that because this has been reaffirmed in answers to Dubia. Um, I mean, right, Kyle? What do, what do you got? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to point out the, the sort of order of our operations whenever Francis has spoke about this issue of, you know, this odd situation of cohabitating people in sort of a pseudo marriage, a civil marriage, approaching communion. Everyone always assumed that he was talking about jumping right to communion because it's, you know, it it opened it up in Mor- Morris. It said, well, the, the church, you know, can help you in this situation. And people were like, okay, what do you mean by help you in this situation? And then 351, the footnote clarified, well, that help can involve recourse to to the sacraments. But you need to follow the order in which he lists the sacraments. First, it's confession, and then it's the Eucharist. So there's there's never an assumption on the part of Francis that people are just, just need to go straight to the Eucharist. It's always to to confession first. And I mean, it is just literally clear from a a quick read of of Morris itself. We haven't even gotten to anything else yet outside of it. Um, We haven't even... This is all pretty, it's pretty expressed in a Morris. I mean, we're right now we're talking about this after the dubia, but this is really something we should have been pounding. You know, I feel a little obtuse for not pounding on this you know, four years ago. Yeah. Because it, it is there. It's there. Um, and we were just kind of hard of heart and slow of faith to recognize what is happening, you know, in the church. And to be as afraid as we were that the vicar of Christ was like being sifted as wheat and falling into error. And um, I think that's like a collective stain on the 21st century church that so much of this pontificate has been derailed over people's fears and by some definite definite cynical conmen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then a lack of, you know, and, and I would say my, you know, myself, you know, I wasn't a, a public figure back in 2016, nor, nor am I really now, you know. <laughs> we have uh, very limited uh, access to the public, but, you know, our, our podcast is growing. Even even back then, you know, guiding my friends to understand this better when this first came out, um, you know, I'm probably culpable in in not, you know, doing doing the due diligence myself to figure out like what Amoris actually said. Um, 
I'm probably culpable in kind of listening to the voices out there who probably didn't even read the document itself and heard it from someone else that it was bad and they then they told me it was bad and I'm like, oh, wait, what's going on? And so, yeah, I mean, the part of this is tr starting to uh, make up for my own lack of diligence back then. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's easy to have, like we said, the, the, the propaganda was everywhere. Mm -hmm. I would check conservative Catholic media every morning and read all the articles and I'd be there worrying what's going to happen, you know, leading up to um, that, that synod, that the synod on families. Um, and I remember being really nervous. And then when it dropped, it's like, okay, I can explain this. I attempted to explain it some, but you know, it wasn't like wholehearted. It was with like nervousness. You know, I was yeah. had a, a feeling of like dread. Oh, what's going to happen? What's around the corner? And it, that's not theology. That's not being like a theologian. You know, I'm only a master's in theology. I don't really call myself a theologian, but you know, it's not, that's not practicing theology. That's, um, that's practicing religious studies because theology is done with faith and all of these documents need to be read with the eyes of faith. Like there's more, you know, this isn't the leader of like the Baptist church. This isn't, uh, a secular political leader writing this document that is inevitably going to let you down. This is the vicar of Christ, the head of the Catholic church on earth. And he is guided by more than just his own intellect and his own will. He's guided in a sui generis way by the Holy Spirit. You know, Christ reigns through the Holy Father. So all of our worries, you know, it's like a kid, you know, going in for to like a doctor to get medicine. Um, you're worried ahead of time, like, oh, what if I have, what if I get a shot and I, I have, the needle really hurts? Or what if it cuts me real bad? Or what if I have an allergic reaction or something like that and you have like all this dread the night before and then you go to the doctor and you get the shot and it hurts for a second and you're like oh that really wasn't bad i was dreading that that's what i was so worried about that's what i was dreading so much and you always have the dumb friends that are like oh the needle's like six feet long and you know it could go through your heart if he does it the wrong way and i knew a guy uh he went in to get a routine shot and he ended up dead six days later and uh you know those are like the taylor marshalls they're, they're the retard friends that are telling you like you're gonna die from your shot and the doctor's a quack and he's trying to poison you and like you know it's whatever uh, it's wrong to get blood transfusions or whatever it is um that's what was happening and we were all believing our retarded friends instead of just being like hey i'm a faithful catholic you know i i realize that the church is guided by by Christ and he's going to be with us always even unto the consummation of the world but so even after this so Pope Francis like we have the dubia going on you know people are asking him questions reporters are trying to probe him you've got like the papal posse um, you know like analyzing all of his moves uh, for like hints but meanwhile the the bishops of Buenos Aires write him a letter being like, do we have the proper interpretation of Amoris? And he writes them back and is like, yes, what you say is really the only interpretation of it. And it, it is. I mean, reading what they wrote, it's pretty dead on the money for like that is a fair takeaway for what Amoris means. That's a fair read. So then he writes them back. It's like, yes. And he publishes this in the um, Acta Apostolic Isaitis. Uh, and makes it officially magisterial, like their interpretation, because they gave a good faith interpretation. And that lends, because that's a, now a magisterial act. It's not just a local bishop's conference. It's now the Pope giving something his imprimatur and publishing it as the correct interpretation. Then that becomes magisterial, and you can use that to guide us. So again, dubia aren't super necessary, because he's giving us all these hints to guide us and how this thing is to be interpreted. And this is what they say in the relevant paragraphs. They say, when the specific circumstance of a couple make it feasible, especially when both are Christians with a path of faith, the effort to live in continence can be proposed. Amoris Laetitia does not ignore the difficulties of this option 
and leaves open the possibility of accessing the sacrament of reconciliation when that purpose is failed, according to the teaching of St. John Paul II. Um, yeah. Next paragraph. In other more complex circumstances and where a declaration of invalidity could not be obtained, the mentioned option may not, in fact, be feasible. However, a path of discernment is also possible. If it is recognized that in a specific case, there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and guilt, mitigate responsibility and guilt. Let's say that again, mitigate responsibility and guilt, particularly when a person considers that he or she would fall into a subsequent fault by harming the children of the new union. Amoris Laetitia opens the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. Mm. Again, the, the, turn, the order, the same order. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And these in turn dispose the person to continue maturing and growing with the force of grace. Yeah, same order. Reconciliation. What do you need, by the way, for a valid confession? To make a valid confession, you have to have firm purpose of amendment. You have to have a detestation of your sin. You have to have contrition. You have to have compunctio cordis. Um so all of this is rolled in to that analysis like that this person you know they slip they have a compromised will maybe they have a compromise compromised intellect in some way and you know they they want to progress down the road to holiness despite disordered objectively disordered circumstances then after they go to confession and receive sacramental absolution then they can approach the holy eucharist because they are not in a state of mortal sin so you don't give food to a dead man right first corinthians eleven twenty seven makes this pretty clear right this is if you eat and drink of the body and blood of jesus christ in an unworthy state you eat and drink judgment on yourself yep. um you eat and drink a curse on yourself but you're not in an unworthy state if you're not in mortal sin because if you're not in mortal sin what does mortal sin do it kills your friendship with God. It kills the life of God living within you, sanctifying grace. But if you're in sanctifying grace, that food is a it does avail you. It is good for you because you're not a dead man. God is living within you. You have the life of God in you. And you can eat and therefore grow in grace and that can strengthen your resolve. So what they're saying is Again, 100% orthodox. What's the issue with it? What's the problem with it? Well, yeah, and I would just point out, too, that for those in a state of sanctifying grace, they're not perfect. And this is exactly what Pope Francis was getting at in the original 351 footnote at the end of it. He said, I would also point out that the Eucharist, remember he mentioned confession first, and now he's talking about the Eucharist. I would also point out that the Eucharist is not a pride, and he got a lot of flack for this. And I even uncritically gave him flack for this. He says that the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. What does he mean there? He doesn't mean people in a state of mortal sin. Those people would need to have recourse to a different sacrament that would be the sacrament of reconciliation. He is talking about people who might be in a state of venial sin, who are still in a state of grace, who are, you know, they still have an attachment to sin. There's all these various th ways you can struggle with sin and still be in a state of grace. All kinds of ways. You know, you're not perfect when you went out, walk out of the confessional. You're still, you still have to do penance. You still have to re reform to amend your life and avo avoid the near occasion of sin and all these various things. And what's going to help you do that? Well, it's the powerful medicine and nourishment of the Eucharist. That's all Pope Francis is saying there. He's, he's not, because people use this line to, again, slander the Pope and claim he was uh, saying that people in a state of moral sin could receive the Eucharist. Yeah, no, that, that's right. Or they suggest that somehow Pope Francis is saying that, you know, fornication, adultery, these things aren't mortal sins. So either, either he's getting rid <laughs> of the idea that these, you know, heinous sexual sins are mortal sins or, you know, he's allowing bad people to access the immortal sin, um, 
the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in like a devastating act of heteropraxy. And, you know, those aren't the options. And yeah, you do have to interpret the Pope in a hermeneutic of continuity and a hermeneutic of trust. You have to understand that he you have to strive, go out of your way to interpret what he's saying um, in in continuity with his forebears, with that unbroken line of magisterium going back to the beginning of the church you have to try and read it through that lens again we are not doing religious studies we're doing theology and when you do theology it's always through faith and the church makes this clear you know this is what the church teaches this isn't us when you read something you don't just read the bible like you know some german professor would where it's like who was the real historical jesus based on clues lurking in the pages and you know he, the apostles they just embellished the miracles so that they because they were really excited about um you know early christianity and wanted to make it grow like that's that's a secular lens you read scripture through the eyes of faith that's theology and you read the pope through the eyes of faith and know that he's guided by the holy spirit and he's not just some guy at a keyboard typing late at night um no not at all but it's funny, people will extend these the, the hermeneutic of trust to their favorite podcasters and their favorite grifters, but they won't do it towards the Pope. You know, they'll go out of their way to defend the bad actors in the church, the guys sowing division and lying to line their pockets, but they won't go out of their way to defend the Pope. And what I'm getting at is this isn't even a strained read. He just says it on the page, you know? It, it's actually a much more squinting, strained read to to have like, you know, the whatever it is, the Kwasniewski, the Marshall, uh, the Steve Skojek when he was still a Christian, you know, that kind of read. That's the squinting read. That's the strained read. Yeah. That's the cynical read. It's not the way a Morris just reads. <laughs> Like, it's all right there. I'm not doing some deep textual dive. I'm reading you guys from, like, the pages of the document. It's the black letter. It, Dave, stop reading the black letter and start reading in between the lines where the real conspiracies lie. Come on. I'm like, why, why are you doing that? <laughs> well, Pope Francis is a Freemason, I'm told. And actually, if you read the lines backwards and upside down, it actually spells out Freemason if you take uh, alternating words from the paragraphs. And it's stupid. There's so many dingbats out there that propose conspiracy theories and who butcher the words to steal defeat out of the jaws of victory so that they can make content that low IQ boomers will, you know, lap up. But yeah. low IQ uh, boomer women will lap up and tell them that they're saving the church by putting out lies about. It. So, like, let me get to the next paragraph. This is the last one I'm going to read from the the letter um, that Pope Francis published from the Buenos Aires bishops, because this should also put you to rest. Remember, this is magisterial. It's uh by reference. It's magisterial by reference. Sometimes you can do that in like court documents. Um, you know, you can incorporate something into a, a legal opinion by just referencing it. Mm -hmm. And Pope Francis has made this part of his magisterium. So he says this, um, we must avoid understanding this possibility as unrestricted access to the sacraments or as if any situation justified it. What is proposed is a discernment that adequately distinguishes each case. For example, special care requires a new union that comes from a recent divorce or the situation of somebody who's repeatedly failed in her family commitments, you know, special care is, is required. This is not just a rubber stamp. You get access to the sacraments. You're going to be vetted kind of in a sense. You're going to go through this path of discernment um, where, you know, spiritual guidance, sound spiritual guidance is given to you. So, yeah, could that be abused? And does John Paul II, did he have a decent case? Did he have a decent point? Did he have reservations that were just? Sure, sure. But you don't get to call Pope Francis heterodox or a heretic because he is extending mercy to the farthest bounds that it can be extended within 
the bounds of orthodoxy. You don't get to do that. So he took a different tack, which is his right as the king of the church, as the monarch of the church. The church is the last true monarchy. It is a true monarchy. And all these dork larks that want America to like have a king instead of being a constitutional republic. Like, where are you on that one, bub? Well, yeah. you didn't think of that, did you? Like, you're, you're always whining and bitching about a monarchy and how bad you want one. But we actually have one in the church, and you can't stand it. Because yeah. when the Pope exercises his lawful power, you, you whine about it and when you disagree, of course. Um, and then he go, the, the document goes on. Also, when there's a kind of apology or ostentation, apology meaning defense, or ostentation of one's own situation as if it were part of the Christian ideal. Um, you know, those you're not just rubber stamping the, the sacraments to them. You're not just saying, oh, you, you get by on this path of discernment. This is not unrestricted access to the sacraments or any situation justifying it. No, he, the, the Pope, the bishops who are interpreting the Pope faithfully, they're making it quite clear. This is for, quote, these most difficult cases, you know, difficult cases where the um, will and the intellect are interfered with. They're not fully free. They're not well formed necessarily. Um, that's where this goes. So the, these people who are living in objectively disordered situations can now um, be getting, growing in, in grace by leaps and bounds. You know, there's this infinite, infinite font of grace that's the Eucharist that, of course, gives us um, greater graces the more we're devoted to it, the more we understand it. Um, the more open we are to receiving those graces. These people are, are now getting that food and can grow in the practice of the Catholic faith, in the practice of the Christian religion. And of course, I mean, how many souls might this save? And all people can do is whine about it and lie on the Pope. Yeah, I think, you know, the like we brought up the alleged heresy of Pope Francis in regard to this earlier in the show. And you know, I would just kind of remind people that this is this is really not even a a matter of doctrinal change. And you kind of alluded to this. This is this what this is at the end of the day is just some sort of um, new application. It's it's like a pastoral allowance. Um, that's how I would phrase it. And you know, it it, it involves that discernment. It involves pastors meeting with couples having conversations, uh, hopefully the pastor is well-formed, and that's where, as you mentioned, you could get those abuses in it. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, that's that's on the pastor to, to lead that discernment process and those conversations with the couple in the proper way. And, and yeah, there will be abuses, but you know, you're not going to not allow for that just for the, the sake of, well, there might be abuses. No, we still have to allow for it even if you know we realize that people are fallible, the couple and the priests, yeah, they're fallible. They might make, they might make mistakes, and hopefully they're well formed. The you know what's stupid about that though? About all the worry about abuses, like all these abuses are taking place anyway. <laughs> you know, like a lot of these people who don't have recourse to this path, you know, who are just in ignorance are 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 receiving unworthily anyway. They're just going to go up. Brad talking point. Yeah. They're just so going to go up for communion. Actually, go, go ahead, Kyle. No, yeah, no, you're right. That's what I originally, I remember saying that originally when this came out in 2016, I thought to myself, how many people is this actually going to reach? How many people is this actually going to affect? Because we know from studies, just simple facts about faith in the Eucharist, something like, you know, the vast majority, 70%, of Catholics don't actually believe in transubstantiation. Well, if that's the fact, then then people on their second and third marriages who have not received an annulment, who don't even know what an annulment is, who show up at mass every once in a while, they're just going to go up for communion. They're not going to get into the weeds on any of this and approach their pastor and saying, you know, we're trying to you know reconcile our, our situation and make it regular. They're not going to do any of that. They're just going up for communion. Members of my family who are in these situations, 
who are not seeking pastoral guidance at all and probably will never are just going to go up for communion it's going like you said it's going to happen anyways unfortunately it's not an excuse but yeah to claim that every single one of these couples is going to their priest and and getting this exception or this discernment exception whatever it's just not going to happen well no so it seems like it can basically only do good because i never see people not going to communion anyway yeah. every week i basically see the whole church rise and go to communion and receive like unthinkingly so if anything you know there are people who were not going to church because they felt like disregarded or kind of swept under the rug or in a certain way like excommunicated by the church for being in this serious sin uh well, it's not like mince words you know it, it is of itself grave matter to be in like an adulterous second union um but maybe this will call them back and they will go through this process whereas before they had just left the church entirely and you know a lot of people like like you said are they're not really thinking twice about these Eucharistic issues anyway. There's tons of Eucharistic abuse. So it seems like if we put this in the balance, the number of people actually helped by this versus the number of people that will be kind of patted on the back as they jump off a cliff and eat and drink judgment on themselves, it seems like it probably weighs in the balance of the salvation of souls, which is, you know, likely why this is kind of Kairos that this happened right now. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's important. It's important. It could, it like you said, it can only do good, you know, barring the the abuses if they take place. But it's uh, my prediction is that it would do more good uh, than potential harm because you're going to have the occasional couple who might somehow stumble across this stuff, or the occasional pastor who might know a couple in an irregular situation and might reach out with this new pastoral allowance and say, hey. You know, why don't we sit down? Why don't you, you know, come to the rectory and we can meet after mass and I can kind of explain these things to you and we can see if we can't regularize your situation or get you back to the sacrament of confession at, at the very least to allow you to hopefully get on a path of of regularizing your situation and, you know, uh, saving your soul at the end of the day. Yeah, whereas previously, you know, people might have felt uh, wrongly, of course, um, but optics matter, cast off by the church. Yeah, and intimidated to approach their pastor, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, I just, the whole thing is silly. It, it's a controversy. Um, there's a tempest in a teapot. You know, it, it's a controversy that's been whipped up for, it's been drummed up beyond what it should be. Uh, all of the reasoning is there. And um, yeah, but we still have dubia, right? I mean, we have this dubia from a Czech cardinal. And that's, uh, you, you've corrected me on the, the pronunciation here. It's Duca, Duca? I think it's Duca. I mean, we're, in the comments, if you know how to pronounce this Czech name, D-U-K-A, I think it's Duca. I don't know. Yeah, I can't even pronounce English names. You're like, you're, you're Kylie, right? <laughs> yes, uh, Kyle, Kyle, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Gordon, uh, David Gordon. I mean, so what are your takes on the answer to the dubia in the relevant parts where it's like, is it a decision of the ordinary magisterium of the church based on the document Amoris Laetitia? And is Amoris Laetitia's intention to institutionalize this solution through a permit or an an official decision for individual couples. So, oh, I mean, what, yeah. do you, what do you take? Yeah, you I, take? I do want to get to that, but I do, I do want to just want to wrap up uh, my take on um, the Buenos Aires document, and this will kind of lead into the to the Duca sure. document. Oh, sorry, I didn't know you had more on that. No, I, yeah, yeah, no, I'm an idiot. No, no, no worries. You you wouldn't Puzzles? you wouldn't know. Um, yeah, I would just so so we we kind of ended up we talked about the whole discernment issue between the pastor and the couple. Um, that, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting because the fear was, oh, you know, every pastor is just going to allow, you know, whoever to go and receive the Eucharist. Now, like that's going to be the discernment. It's going to be a five second thing where it's like, oh yeah, Pope Francis says it's okay. Go do it. But no, the letter, uh, the, the Buenos Aires document like specifically speaks against that in 
paragraph seven. But we have to avoid the understanding, uh, but we have to avoid understanding this possibility as an unlimited access to the sacraments as if all situations warrant it. So they're saying literally, it's not just some blanket allowance for any couple in this situation to go up and receive communion. No, it has to be vetted. It has to go through this process of discernment, hopefully with a competent pastor. And then two, you mentioned the issue of reading this in a hermeneutic continuity, reading this in line, especially with what predecessor popes have said. John Paul II is specifically referenced here as someone in um, you know, documents like Familiaris Consortio and other places where JP2 has reiterated the church's call for these couples to live continently. Like that is the preferential option here. That is what pastors should be leading with, is this trying to get this couple in an irregular situation, even if they're still gonna be cohabitating under the same roof, is to somehow live continently. You know, stop, it because they're basically uh, fornicating at that point because um, it is an adulterous uh, sort of relationship. So it's, it's you know, some form of sexual sin outside of marriage um, to get them to stop doing that. They can live together, especially because many of them have children. So it's like not feasible for like just the, the dad to move out. Like in some situations, this would be un uncalled for. So they're going to live in the same in the same house. They can cohabitate. Um, that's just kind of what the circumstances dictate in certain situations but to live as brother and sister, live in continence until they can, whatever, get an annulment, get their marriage um, you know, ratified in the church and all that. And that's exactly what JP2 said, and that's exactly what is reiterated in the Buenos Aires letter. And this is gonna lead us into to the latest dubia that kind of went under the radar because there was some other dubia, which, which we'll talk about later that kind of overshadowed this one. But back in July, just of July of this year, uh, Czech, he's, an, he's a retired uh, archbishop. Uh, his name is Cardinal Dominic Duca. He's the retired archbishop of Prague. And he, along with his fellow Czech bishops from the bishop's conference over there, submitted a set, um, you know, submitted a, du a dubia to, to Pope Francis, specifically, almost all of these questions have to do, I think they all do, have to do with Amoris Laetitia. So, if you were ever wondering of like, if, is Pope Francis ever going to answer the 2016 dubia? Here is your definitive answer right here. Yeah, it took a while and it was kind of unnecessary, but you know, I think under the, the Cardinal Fernandez DDF, he's kind of pushing this because um, Fernandez is, is, you know, he comes through quite, quite clear his voice in this document. So again, the call is for continence. And I just want to read that section of here, of it here. Okay. So um, first of all, I mean, you asked about, is this magisterial? First of all, before I answer the continence thing, I want to say absolutely in at least two questions. This document, these responses, uh, resp response to the dubia, affirm that the original apostolic ex exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, and the, the Buenos Aires document, if you didn't know so already, because one was an apostolic exhortation, de facto magisterial, t teaching about faith and morals, the Buenos Aires thing was confirmed, ratified, papally ratified, put in the AAS, so we knew this all the way back in 2016, but just to you know pour salt in the wounds of anyone who's denying that this is a magisterial document, the um, it's expressly confirmed here that yes, both of those things are magisterial document. It's it's super cut and dry. Um, I mean, you had even people like, and I don't know if he ever retracted this, and I hopefully he wasn't, but you know even people like Cardinal Burke suggesting that a Morris wasn't magisterial somehow. I mean, that, that's just bizarre that, you know, the, the former head of the apostolic signatura would even say that. And, you know, check me if I'm wrong in the comments, if you've seen somewhere where Cardinal Burke has retracted that 
or maybe you know I was reading that wrong, but it seemed to me from Burke's statement back in, I think it was 2016, um, where he denies that it's part of the magisterium. And well, I think the, the reasoning was, yeah, and I've seen the same things you have, and um, I have not seen a retraction, but I think the reasoning, if I may, uh, that Burke was giving is that if this somehow contradicts in an irreconcilable way the previous magisterium of the church, then it's void ab initio. Okay. You know, void from the beginning. I think that's the line of reasoning that he would be employing there. It was like a um, hypo hypothetical, though. If it contradicted, then it would not be magisterial. Is that what he was saying? Well, I think he was saying that it did. I don't want to supply any negative words to him or be like detracting. My read and intuition was that it, in his opinion, was not magisterial because it did. Okay. It did uh, create a contradiction with like the magisterium of particularly John Paul II when he shot down like Cardinal Walter Casper on this. Um, that's my understanding. Again, I'm happy to be corrected. I'm not trying to detract from. You know, Colonel Burke, uh, a lot of his work I've admired through the years. But that's my understanding of what he would be saying. And of course, as we've shown, the moral analysis in Amoris Laetitia in no way uh, is irreconcilable with the classic Catholic moral analysis, um, even in what's in the, the catechism of JP2, that 92 catechism, um, as and he quoted it there. So... It's a change in discipline, certainly, but the Pope, you know, can change discipline. That's part of having the keys and the binding and loosing power. So there's no problem there. Um, I, I think it was that Burke mistakenly understood this as a contradiction. Yeah, yeah, that could very well be the case. And yeah, and again, just to, to make it clear, yeah, we're not uh, definitively pronouncing on, on what Burke said there. But even if, even if, you know, we, uh, we were to grant, you know, the worst reading of that, he would still be merely speaking as a private theologian. He wasn't speaking as the head of any dicastery at that point. So obviously we're free, if he indeed said that or meant that or whatever it was, uh, we were free to disagree with that. Um, well, hey, and the Pope, you know, it's Pope Francis versus the Cardinal. I'm going with the Pope, you know, <laughs> yeah. the Pope is the, the head of the bishops. He's yeah. um, the head of the church and the bishops owe Pope Francis obedience. So I have no qualms if you know, there's an irreconcilable difference between a, a bishop and the pope to take the pope's side. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty cut and dry. It's pretty hard to argue that um, <laughs> an apostolic exhortation such as Amoris is not magisterial, nor is the Buenos Aires document. It's hard to argue that still that those are not magisterial. So, but again, the Duca, the responses to Cardinal Duca once again confirm that and one of the i think one of the key passages to this document is an answer to the question um in the it's you know question number three is this a decision so this is what the the czech cardinals are asking is this a decision of the ordinary magisterium of the church based on the document amoris laetitia so this is referring to the buenos aires uh the ratification of the buenos aires document and uh the, the DDF uh, response is this. This document builds on the magisterium of previous pontiffs who already recognized the possibility for divorcees in new unions to have access to the Eucharist. So there is a path towards access to the Eucharist. I mean, all sinners after repentance have access to the Eucharist. Continuing on, as long as they make a, and here it is, commitment to live in full continence that is to abstain from the acts proper to spouses as proposed by john paul ii and followed up by benedict the sixteenth so they're like this is in line the call to continence pastorally must be the preferential option that you give to people now uh, francis maintains the proposal of full continence for divorce and remarried in a new union, uh, but admits, so Francis maintains that too. It's literally saying Francis is in line with Benedict and John Paul II on the call to continence. But Francis admits that there may be difficulties in practicing it. Well, for sure. 
I mean, how hard is that going to be for some people to do? It's like you were, you're, you're just in a, in a second so-called marriage, a civil marriage. You didn't get an annulment from your first marriage. And then you may have kids in this new civil marriage. And obviously, you know, you were have, having sexual intercourse. And then to be hit with the fact that, oh, I got to live as brother and sister now, which is what they ought to do. But, you know, easier said than done, right? And Francis is just literally acknowledging that this is going to be difficult for a lot of people. But, um, and therefore allows, and therefore Francis allows in certain cases after proper discernment, the administration of the sacrament uh, of reconciliation, even when one fails in being faithful to the continence proposed by the church. In other words, so if you have a couple who's trying to remain continent, who in, in steps towards regularizing their marital situation, and they screw up, okay, they can go to confession. That's all that's saying. Yes, sinners who screw up, who are uh, properly repentant, can go to the sacrament of reconciliation. That's literally all that's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, man, it's it's much ado about nothing. Um you guys, you, you got to read the documents. I, I, I'm surprised in this whole thing about how many people have formulated very strong opinions adverse to the Pope, and they haven't even like read a document. But they'll be like, I'm leaving the church. I saw that on the Taylor Marshall uh, <laughs> video um, the other day. I'm leaving the church over this. It's like, have you even read the document? People I don't, don't understand. People don't read in general, Dave. There's a, yeah. there's a lack of literacy, um, especially in the Western world, and they would just rather have some idiot tell you what to think. And unfortunately... I don't exactly <laughs> re-add. It's not my thing. Yeah, that, I mean, people just want someone to tell them what to think. And I, I would hope, like, before you listen to us, I mean, we are leagues ahead of someone like Taylor Marshall in understanding and explaining this stuff. So we're going to try to give you, you know, the straight dope, the actual explanation as to what to think here. But we're not even saying the buck stops with us. As Dave said, people, you need to go out and read this stuff yourself. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're not competent enough to understand, you know, the magisterial theological nuances, find someone who is. You know, find good voices like us and, you know, Michael Lofton over at Reason and Theology. And, uh, you know, the Logos Project is doing really good stuff with this. There's a lot of really good voices out there. Um, unfortunately, they're just not as popular as the pseudotrads. Well, I mean, the, the litmus test is anytime somebody's cleaving from the Pope, they're wrong. You don't cleave from the Pope. You just don't. I mean, I thought this was a trad talking point, and it's a true one. Like, you have to be united to the Roman pontiff to be saved. And yet, when, you know, trads are fine saying that against the Protestants and whatnot, and even maybe people who are truly in invincible ignorance, but then they'll just be like, nah, I, I'm going to defy. Non serviam. You know, I, I'll defy the Pope. It's cool. Uh, because, you know... I don't, I don't understand how you square this doctrine and this practice with this past teaching. So I'm going to rely on my own intellect. That's not faith. What this pontificate is bringing out is that many people simply don't have faith. They're in club Catholic. People are members of the Catholic club, but they're not practicing the Catholic faith. You, you know, they... They'll go along and do catholic -y stuff and get the sacraments and, like, make the sign of the cross as long as they can understand everything. But then when it's truly like, okay, well, here, you know Christ set up his church. You know he gave the pope the keys to the kingdom of heaven, binding and loosing power, authority. He promised him that he was going to guide him so that the pope could feed the sheep until the consummation of the world. Now the popes are going to do that. Um, the, the popes are going to always be faithful. There's not going to be a heretical pope. But the first sign of trouble where people don't, and, you know, they're limited intellects, you know? All these people that I see, like, 
publicly apostatizing on the Taylor Marshall podcast. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed, you know, they're not the sharpest knives in the drawer. It's people, you know, like smashing their keyboard in who don't know punctuation, who are declaring, you know, their own eternal demise with glee. Uh, you know, they, they're, they can't connect dots intellectually that maybe you have to have some understanding of the history of the church and sacramentology and moral theology. They can't at first glance, even if they're even reading the document and they're not just reading some crappy life site news article on it. Um, you know, that was with some clickbait headline and some misleading lead, uh, written by John Henry. I have two psychology degrees and no theology training. Um, you know, if they're even reading the initial document and they, they have a problem with it, they're, they're leaving the church. And most of them are just getting stuff from their favorite pundit and like declaring that they're going to leave the church. We're in a real weird time, but it's really apparent. And I think a lot of good in a sense is coming out of this pontificate, even though it has been, it's, it points troublesome. And I think a lot of people have had some, some, you know, worries, uh, because we're human, because our faith is frail. But what's come out of this, one thing is that a lot of the people who are without faith, you know, we know that a lot of people don't have real faith, who who don't have a faith to speak of. They were in club Catholic. They were cultural Catholics, but on the right. They enjoyed, you know, talking about the supernatural mysteries. They enjoyed talking about uh, the sacraments and I guess spending a couple hours in line for like confession on a Saturday or whatever. But the supernatural faith element has been dead for a long time because supernatural faith means you don't necessarily need to see all ends. You just need to. Yes, faith is reasonable. You see that, you know, Christ existed. He established his church. He was God. He's protecting his church. The pope said this and another pope said this. I can't understand it. But hey, I have faith. Because everything adds up, and I don't need to understand everything. Yeah, having to understand everything—that's not faith, and and that's been drawn out. Other things have been drawn out. Is that the wolves in sheep's clothing, or the people who called themselves Catholic but didn't have an understanding of the primacy of Peter, who didn't understand liturgical theology, who didn't understand ecclesiology? They're also outing themselves. They're outing themselves as the predators that they are as the people who are pockmarked and who are stained and who are not part of the necessarily faithful fold of Christ. Those people have all outed themselves, or many have outed themselves in this pontificate, and now they will forever be blemished. And we're not putting the genie back in the bottle. Obviously, I pray for them. I want their eternal salvation. I hope they repent of their descent. I hope they come fully back into the fold of Christ, uh, God willing. I truly mean that. But I think a lot of them are not. And you're going to see because, you know, you think it just stops here. Are you guys that naive that you think the descent stops at the Francis pontificate? There's going to be problems with the successor. You know, if social media had been a thing, the people would have been decrying John Paul II and calling him a heretic. He's the one who made the big changes on the death penalty. He's the one who advanced the doctrine, really. It wasn't Francis. Francis just moved the ball the extra yard. John Paul II and moved it 98 yards down the field. Yeah. Um, and the, and the, the Quran. Uh, yeah. And they were. Oh, to be fair, there were, if, you, if you were in those rad trad circles back then where like the only outlet you had to read and say things about it was like some obscure, you know, mail in thing or you know, some weird magazine or newspaper you couldn't just go to the set of a contest website because those didn't exist yeah. but they were there i mean they were calling john paul ii all you know all for all that stuff back then and saying he was a heretic but it just wasn't mainstream and now sure. with the advent of these new technologies that's the double-edged sword unfortunately is that they now can now be mainstream and influence and mislead a lot more people no, the hundred percent. It's a good, good, um, like correction. It's a good thing. I'm good. You, I'm glad you put that asterisk in there. Yeah, it existed, but it was not as mainstream 
now with the internet, everything, 24 hour news cycle, people can get their news on Twitter. It's not verified. There's no editorial standards. People just throw up whatever they want. It gets retweeted if it's saucy enough, if it's sexy enough. And then it's, it's a, just a giant rumor mill. Social media is a giant rumor mill. And, you know, the most extreme people with um, the most sensationalist takes can garner all the clicks, especially if they don't have scruples. Um, then they can just eat up the clicks and then people just repeat each other. It's a giant game of telephone. Mm -hmm. People repeat, 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 and the news gets farther away. There's pitfalls in any pontificate. There's problems with any pontificate. Um, and now we just have a 24 hour rumor mill going on, but yeah, so this is going to keep up the next pontificate. Keep your eyes open. Like we'll revisit this. You think everyone's just going to quiet down? There's a very lucrative business model that's been developed, you know, read a document on, you know, your favorite, like low budget journalism light, you know, Catholic alt right site, read, read that article, uh, take it, um, it, talk about it for 15, 20, 30 minutes, uh, whip up the frenzy of your supporters get their donations based on like so-called church scandals problems in the church and then uh rinse and repeat do it with the next news cycle and you just go on ad infinitum so you think that guys are going to give up that business model of of reading an alt-right catholic site for a while um and getting some clickbait headline and then pitching it to their posse of like a hundred thousand youtube subscribers uh, and, and saying that they're the true prophetic voice crying out in the wilderness uh, and the Pope is misleading everybody, you think they're going to give that up? You know, their ticket to, what, a couple hundred grand a year just for sitting in their basement, like putting out, you know, sensationalist clickbait, um, red meat to the wolves? You think they're giving that up next pontificate? You guys, like, again, I've said it before, but... If I told you Wolverines made good house pets, would you believe me? You really think that's going to happen? Because that's gullible is not in the dictionary. The word gullible, not in the dictionary. So, uh, yeah, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Um, they're going to the business model marches on. But anyway, that is a Morris in a nutshell, not heterodox. And don't you feel dumb? Yeah, but again, it's in some ways, in some sectors, it's not going to do any good because they're going to keep propagating the lie, just like they will keep propagating the Pachamama scandal lie, uh, and all the various other accusations against the current pontiff, all of those are going to take a long time to die. I mean, you think of like how long it takes a heresy to die. And does it ever really die? No, because it like reformulates and comes back in the next generation and it comes back centuries later in sort of a tweaked fashion. You just can't get rid of this stuff. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're always going to exist, unfortunately, until the second coming. Um, but hopefully we can make a dent at least in or contribute somehow in changing the tide, in changing the narrative and getting people equipped to have talking points where they can defend against this stuff um yeah once you've blown their credibility wide open hopefully people see that somebody who's uh not trustworthy in one thing is generally not going to be trustworthy in another so hopefully by punching holes in their credibility although this is um you know they just throw whatever against the wall and and see what sticks so it's it's impossible to take on all of the mini conspiracy theories and whatnot. But hopefully by punching enough holes in the credibility um, of, of people maligning the Holy Father and the church and the magisterium, you know, hopefully that makes people think the next time they hear the sensationalist clickbait emanating from, you know, whoever. Yeah. Yeah, we can only hope and pray. And, you know, I know we're going to close up here pretty soon, but... I just wanted to touch on something you mentioned, Dave, earlier in that, you know, your experience maybe around the time of Morris when it first came out, you know, a little bit earlier on 
in your Catholic journey, you know, you had that that anxiety of like, what is the Pope going to say next? Like you would, you were defending it, and you were still, you know, giving him the benefit of the doubt. But there was always like, am I doing the right thing? Is he actually going to contradict whatever? Like I had that same same amount of anxiety, that same experience of anxiety of, well, my goodness, what's the Pope going to say next? But I think you offered the solution. Is that that displays honestly? It displays a lack of faith. It displays a lack of faith in the papal charism, the office of the Pope, the indefectibility of the church. Once you have faith in you know, what Christ promised, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, that God you know, is going to lead us to all righteousness and all truth, and he does that from the time of Pentecost, through the Holy Spirit, guiding the church after Christ's ascension, like all of that is very reassuring. And we need to keep that in the forefront of our mind. And this actually played out for me earlier today. Like, yeah, I, would, I was back there in Amoris days having that anxiety about, oh my gosh, are they going to change something? Like, what, what's going to happen? I don't have that anymore because I have that hermeneutic of trust. Just today, um, when, when we're, we're recording this, maybe we'll release this later, but uh, we're recording this on the day that the the most recent Pope Francis, I think it was, I believe it was an apostolic exhortation, uh, Laudate Deum. Uh, so, you know, the so-called Laudato C 2.0, which we thought was going to be an encyclical. It turns out to be an exhortation. Uh, I read the thing today. Uh, Dave, I think you read the thing today, but I wasn't worried. I knew there was going to be, you know, things about, there was going to be a bunch of stuff in we'll do it. We'll do a show on it. I knew there was going to be eco theology, not having eco theology, just like, you know, statements from the pontiff about just scientific facts or pseudo facts. We'll talk about that. And I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried about it. And I read, you know, and there was, there was a theological element to it towards the end. He did, he did reiterate some things in terms of uh, stewardship and ecology and things like that, things that's you know, I wouldn't have any problem with, but I wasn't scared that he was going to change everything, anything. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a pleasant experience, but, you know, as opposed to something that should be nerve wracking. Yeah. The theology is fine. The theology is fine. It's just an application of the timeless moral principles of like good stewardship, um, to, what the Pope sees as a current crisis, and he has no particular facility in science. Um, we owe him the respect of having heard out his scientific ideas, but you know that's not his his charism. That's not um, his wheelhouse. Obviously, those are faith and morals. So yeah, it seems pretty innocuous. Although I obviously quibble about the science, and uh, you know still hold firmly that the link between the temperature rise on earth and uh you know the activities of man and what that relationship is and whether it's a causal relationship whether uh there's an inverse relationship between temperature and co2 or whether co2 levels are more directly linked with temperature you know there, there can be other variables at play there uh those are things that i find in my prudence um in, in my background in, in certain sciences to be insufficiently established and the Pope doesn't have facility, but the theology and morals of it were fine. So yeah, much consternation about nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to see the rollout on that. We're going to see the pseudo trads come out swinging and again, accuse the Pope of probably heresy and having some globalist agenda and all, all the old conspiracy talking points. So, uh, Stay tuned for that. We have much more raw meat. <laughs> you know, they're going to provide us with a lot of ammunition, a lot of things to talk about, uh, as, as, as reactionaries always do. And, and our reaction to that is going to be to hopefully uh, lead you all in the right direction and give you the correct take on it and the correct talking points. And we, we welcome discussion on it. You know, please... As we close up here, leave leave a comment. Maybe you disagree with us. Maybe you agree with, with us. Want to give us a thumbs up. Please do any of that in the comments section, and we'll be happy to engage with you. 
also to support us um, in on Patreon in the link in the show notes below. Please, I mean we. What that does, it is it allows us to make good videos like this, that that go against the pseudo trad narrative, that allow right thinking principles to come come through, and you can play a, a crucial role in making that happen by your support. Pray for us if you can't support us monetarily, but if you can support us monetarily, we would highly highly recommend you do so. <laughs> I recommend it. It's number one in my book. <laughs> yeah, prayers are good, but uh, <laughs> I'm joking. That's right. Yeah. All right, uh, Dave, you want to close it? You you opened the show, so you got to close this up now. Yeah, I'm just gonna be like, well, see y'all. <laughs> see y'all. God bless you. I'm gonna say God bless you, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>